Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining class today. And it's our uh, Republic Day of our nation. So happy Republic Day to all of you. Um, can somebody lead us in prayer this morning, please? This morning, please. Go ahead, success. You want to lead us in prayer? Lead us in prayer. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, the Tana Rock of Ages want to say thank you for yet bright new day. Thank you, Lord, because you kept us up by the night. Thank you, Lord, because we are sunned this morning. Thank you, all of our lecturers. Thank you for the rest of our students. Be that glorified in the name of Jesus. Lord, we commit this lecture into your hands, O Lord. Father, feed us afresh with Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, success. Um, okay. So we'll continue with uh, our lesson that we uh, began last week. We were in lesson three. We were talking about the nature of God. Okay. So can somebody tell us what we discussed last week about the nature of God? We basically answered two questions. We began the lesson, Nature of God, by answering two questions. And what are those two questions? How do we know that God exists? Okay, thank you, John. Uh, how do we know that God exists? So we answered that question. Uh, what's the second question we were looking at? What is the meaning of the term nature of God? Okay, so we looked at uh, the existence of God uh, and, now, and then we went on to look at uh, the nature of God. Um, so when we talk about the nature of God, what are we basically saying? We this, uh... We discuss about the characteristics of God, how God reveals Himself. Okay, thank you, John. We're talking about when we we when we use the word nature of God, we're basically uh, saying uh, we're talking about His uh, attributes, His characteristic, and um, uh, how do we know about the nature of God? Or how is the nature of God revealed to us through scriptures? Okay, through his word. What about the others? How is the, the nature Holy of God revealed to us? Uh, through the Holy Spirit. Okay, to the Holy Spirit. Yeah, the characteristics of Jesus Christ as manifested. Yes, thank you, Isaac. Uh, the very person of Jesus Christ who is the perfect representative uh, of God, who represents God perfectly, uh, uh, has been revealed to us in the person and work uh, of Jesus. Yes, thank you. So the nature of God is revealed both in his attributes and in his... What is the other thing? One is attributes and the other is... Yeah, his, his, his words. Okay, thank you. Uh, so the na God's nature is revealed both in his attributes and in his name. Uh, last week we looked at nine attributes of God. And uh, the last one that we looked at, uh, we saw that God is sovereign. Uh, and in his sovereignty that he has given, um, uh, you know, man the free will, the free moral will to choose. And uh, even when, so uh, even when we make a wrong choices, that seems to go against the will and the plan and the purpose of God for our life. For uh, when people uh, or nations, when they choose to go against the will and the plan of the purpose of God, uh, you know, God is still sovereign. He's still in control. He's not afraid. He is not intimidated by our choices that He makes. He lets us choose. Um, because he's given us the free will to choose. Of course, we face the consequences for our choices. 
uh, but God is still sovereign uh, in the sense that, uh, you know, he will, um, uh, by any means, he will bring about the plans and the purpose that he has uh, purposed even before the foundations of the world. So we looked at one example about Adam and Eve in the garden. Um, and um, did God know knew, did God know that Adam and Eve are going to sin? Yes. Um, you know, he knew this even before he created them, even before he created everything that exists in creation, uh, even before the foundations of the world, uh, you know, God knew that Adam and Eve are going to disobey him. Uh, but God also had a plan where he, you know, already had planned to send his son. So uh, the, the work of the cross was finished at one point of time in history when Jesus came. But in the mind of God, it was all a, 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 a thing that was already completed. It was a done thing, a completed thing. Uh, we saw that in uh, when we studied in systematic theology. Uh, so it's a completed thing in the, in, the, in the mind of God, but it just happened at one point of time in history. So God is sovereign. Uh, he does what he will, uh, his plan and his purpose, but he lets us to uh, choose. So when, uh, when we choose, we face the consequences of our actions. Uh, and we see that, you know, he being a just God, you know, rewards us according to the choices that we make he doesn't show favoritism or partiality he doesn't choose one nation over the other he doesn't choose one people group over the other he doesn't choose uh, some people for salvation he doesn't uh, leave the others destined to hell uh, but he's a god who's uh, just and uh, you know in his uh, in his sovereignty he's left us to make the choices but in his justice you know he um, uh, rewards us according to the choices that we make and he doesn't show favoritism or partiality now being a uh, just god is you know justice is part of god's nature okay him being just is just very part of his nature it's not a standard that god uh, uh, that exists outside of god that exists outside of himself that he must conform to. Uh, we can't say all of us are just people, uh, but you know we have to uh, meet the justice that is there. We have to conform to the things that are around us. Um, uh, but God is, um, you know, by nature, he's a just God. Okay, it's, it's not a standard that he has to conform to, which is outside of himself, but by his very nature, just like it says that God is love in 1 John, the same way God is just, it is very part of his being, part of his um, nature, and God's uh, justice involves judgment, okay, because he's a just God, he pronounces the judgment so when we do something that is wrong even though we are living in the grace period uh you know god because of who he is his basic nature of being just he pronounces the judgment but why aren't we punished uh like we see in the old testament you know where people just drop down dead or the earth open and they're swallowed up by the earth or you know um uh, there's some plague and they are destroyed. Um, well, it's because uh, those of us who have accepted Jesus, you know, Jesus stands uh, in front of us and says, I have made the punishment for his sins or her sins. And thus what comes out uh, from God's mouth is his judgment, but what passes through the Lamb of God, the slain Lamb of God that is before the throne of God is just grace and mercy. But that grace and mercy, if we take it for granted and we, uh, you know, we, we trample the blood of the covenant under our foot and treat it as something as detestable, then Hebrew says this is no more, uh, you know, uh, uh, forgiveness of sins so that is left, but only a fearful, dreadful punishment okay so god in his justice pronounces uh, his judgment because he's a just god um but we see that you know um it's because of uh, the grace that the the uh, the justifier, the the person who made the uh, uh, the full, sufficient, perfect sacrifice for our sins—that is Jesus Christ. 
uh, we do not receive the wrath of God or we do not receive the uh, punishment of God, but what we receive is forgiveness and what we receive is grace when we ask for forgiveness of sins, okay? So uh, God's justice involves judgment. And um, uh, we, we read this verse uh, uh, last week in uh, Genesis chapter 18, uh, verse 25, where it says, shall not the judge of all the earth do what is right? So God in his justice will do what is right. He will pronounce the uh, judgment. Uh, in his justice, you know, he sent Jesus, just like I said, in his sovereignty, he, you know, he lets us choose, but he has uh, ways where he will accomplish his plan and purpose. In the same way in his justice, he sent uh, Jesus and uh, we read about this in uh, Romans chapter 3, verse 26. So uh, it will be nice if uh, all of you can keep your Bibles open uh, so you can turn quickly to the references and uh, read. Or if you have your, uh, uh, you know, your course notes open, you can just, uh, uh, I don't know if the, the, refer the references are there, but uh, not the verses, so you'll have to open your Bible. So can somebody read Romans three twenty six, please? For the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness and at the present time, so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Yes, thank you. So here it says that, uh, you know, uh, uh, when we put our faith in Jesus and we receive the forgiveness for our sins, God is both the just and the justifier which means that, uh, you know, God is satisfying the demands of his justice. And at the same time, he's being the acquitter. Okay. So how is he being satisfied with the demands of his justice is because uh, Jesus has made the full sufficient, perfect sacrifice uh, that God required for the sins of mankind. And so we see that, you know, he's satisfying the de his demands for the penalty or the punishment for our sins is uh, being uh, justified. And at the same time, he's acquitting us of our sins. So he's both the just and the justifier. So the same judge who passes the sentence also acquits us as guilty. And I explained that. I said that, you know, he's him being just passes a judgment. Okay. Uh, he passes a sentence, but also acquits us as guilty, uh, uh, sorry, as, uh, as you know, uh, uh, free from guilt because of the, uh, uh, the, uh, the punishment that was to be made for our sins was met by Jesus. Okay. Jesus paid for the punishment for our sins. So the same judge, God, who is a judge, passes a sentence and also acquits the guilty of their uh, guilt. So he is a just God. Any uh, doubts, any questions on the, uh, this attribute of God that he is just? No, if not, uh, we'll move on to the next act attribute that he is truthful and uh, faithful. Okay. Uh, John chapter 14, verse 6. Can somebody read that? Somebody else can turn to John chapter 17, verse 17. And uh, someone else can turn to Numbers 23, 19. We'll be looking at these verses. Uh, John chapter 14, verse 6. John chapter 17, verse 17. And somebody else can turn to Numbers 23, 19. Okay. John chapter 14, verse 6. Can somebody read that, please? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Thank you. So Jesus himself, Jesus himself. is the truth. Okay. Um, so he himself is the truth. Uh, John chapter 17, verse 17. Yes, go ahead. Can somebody read that, please? Success, you Thank want to read that? Yes, sir. Okay. okay. So, 17 verse 76, sanctify them through the truth. The word is true. Thank you. So Thank here you. In, so John here in John chapter, in John chapter 17, uh, you know, it's called the high priestly prayer. Uh, Jesus is praying to the Father. 
and uh, he's asking the Father to sanctify us by his truth. That means sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. So God's word uh, is truth. Uh, Numbers chapter 23 verse 19 says that God is truthful. He cannot lie. Can somebody read that please? Numbers 23, 19. God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. He Has he said he, oh, yeah. and he oh, will yeah. not do it? Or has he spoken and he will he not make it good? Okay, thank you. So here we see that God is not a man that he should lie. So God is truth. God is truthful. He cannot lie, which means whatever he's declared in his word, whatever he's uh, uh, you know, pr uh, he's uh, said to the prophets will come true. All the prophecies will come true. What he, the promises that he has made uh, will come true. It's yes and amen. The covenants that he has made is uh, the truth that he has established. Uh, and when we stand on that covenant, when we are part of that covenant, you know, we will enjoy all the blessings or the benefits of the covenant so uh, we see that whatever God says is absolutely truth uh, because we know that God is truth himself and so we can rely on his word uh, the other nature of God or the other attribute of God that is that he is uh, faithful uh, he keeps his promise he never goes back on his promise and uh, since God does not change you know, he cannot be unfaithful, okay? And there is a, a, a phrase given there in your notes. I like to read that faithfulness follows logically from immutability because if God does not change, then he cannot be unfaithful. Now, what is immutability? Immutability is basically talking about the unchanging nature of God. God is unchanging in his being. That means in his nature, in his perfections, in his purposes and his promises. And because his word does not change, because what he says does not change, his promises does not change, um, he is, uh, you know, he cannot be unfaithful because he's not a man that he can lie. Hence, he is a God who is truth. Uh, he himself is truth. And because he's truth, he is also faithful. And uh, because he's faithful, he cannot change. And because he's unchanging, he cannot be unfaithful. Okay. So that is about uh, his attribute of being truthful and faithful. He's also a loving God and a good God. Okay. Uh, we know that, uh, uh, you know, he does not just love us, but his the very core of his nature of, of his be being is that he is love. Because we read in 1 John chapter 4, verses 8 to 10, that God is love. Can somebody read that, please? 1 John chapter 4, verses uh, 8 to 10. And somebody else can uh, open up to Romans chapter 5, verse, verses 6 to 8. 1 John 4, 8 to 10 and Romans 5, 6 to 8. Can somebody read 1 John 4, 8 to 10, please? The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. By this, the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through him. And the, in this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Thank you, John. So here this verse states that God is love and also it shows us how God demonstrated his love that he sent his only um, son. Can somebody else read Romans chapter 5 verses 6 to 8, please? Romans 5, 6 to 8, somebody else? For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For <clears throat> scarcely for a righteousness uh, for a righteous man will one die yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die but god demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners christ died for us 
Thank you, Nicholson. So here we see that how did God demonstrate his love while we were still sinners, imperfect beings, uh, slaves to sin, slave to Satan. Uh, you know, God in his love demonstrated his love to us by sending us his son and, uh, you know, reconciling us back to himself by establishing the new covenant through the blood of uh, Jesus Christ. Okay? So God is absolutely good all the time. We sing that song, God is good all the time. Okay, but do we really, uh, you know... Uh, uh, believe that because when we go through difficult times, uh, you know, we doubt the goodness of God or we doubt his promises. Uh, uh, we think that he's angry with us. He's punishing us. He's, uh, uh, you know, there's a curse that has come upon us. But, you know, God is absolutely good and he's good all the time. Okay. Uh, and in his goodness, he will do us no harm. Okay. Whatever we are going through, whether it's a, a, a difficult situation, a challenging situation, a dis distressing situation, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, we are very sick, unwell, or a loss of a loved one, whatever it is, you know, uh, we, we need to know this, we need to be convinced with this absolute truth that God is good all the time, even when things are going well, when things are going wrong, God is good. And we should not let uh, our circumstances dictate um, the goodness of God in our life. We need to be convinced with this fact that God is good all the time. So our conviction of the goodness of God should be absolute. Uh, we need to, uh, you know, know this for ourselves and, you know, affirm this for ourselves, declare it for ourselves that my God uh, is a good God. He will only do good things for me. Uh, he will protect me. He will preserve me. Uh, and all that he does is out of his goodness for me. So there's something that we need to keep declaring over and over again so that we can hear it for ourselves. And, uh, you know, this truth is established because when we go through difficult times, um, you know, the deceiver uh, is always there uh, to deceive us uh, and, uh, you know, manipulate the truth, twist and turn the truth for us and say, you know, that God does not love you. You know, he's angry with you. He doesn't care about you. This is what you've uh, received because this is how you're living your life. Uh, you know, so we can get tend to get angry with God sometimes and we can all, it can also lead us to go away from our uh, faith. So even though this seems so simple, that God is good all the time. We sing it uh, even when we were kids. Uh, but this truth, this absolute truth should be something that we are deeply convicted uh, about. So even when God corrects us, is he good? When God corrects us, is he being good to us? Yes, yes. 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 You know, when earthly parents uh, correct us because they love us, uh, because uh, they they want the best for us the same way, you know, uh, even when God corrects us, he's doing it out of his uh, goodness, not to destroy us, but to empower us, to encourage us, to lift us up and to put us in the right uh, direction. So we need to look at uh, the correction of God as an expression of his goodness. And we need to be con convinced about this fact that when God is correcting us, you know, it is just an expression of his goodness towards us because he loves us, he uh, cares for us. So we need to celebrate uh, God even when he is correcting us, even when it seems very difficult, even when it seems, uh, you know, unacceptable, even when it seems painful. Uh, just like we celebrate the goodness of God when he does something good for us, you know, we need to also celebrate the goodness of God even in difficult circumstances and situations and even when he is correcting us. So we need to be convinced about the goodness of God because when we are convinced about the goodness of God, uh, we can say that all things work for the good of those who love him and called according to his uh, purpose. Okay, even when you are convinced about the goodness of God, uh, when you make a mistake, it will help you to, you know, not get angry with God, um, not uh, go against his will, 
not stop reading a Bible and praying or having a relationship with him or even going to church, but it will help you to turn around, return to God, uh, because when you do that, you know, God can fix things back for you uh, because he is a good, he's a loving God and he is a faithful God. Okay. The last attribute of God uh, we will look at, which is not the last about his attributes, but just in the list that we are looking at, is that he is a merciful and a very gracious God. Okay, it's a merciful and a gracious God. God in his mercy, you know, he gives us his grace. Uh, he gives us grace for uh, salvation. He gives us grace for healing. Um, you know, the blind man Bartimaeus, when no one, um, uh, you know, was willing to take him to Jesus uh, and there was a big crowd and since he being blind couldn't see where Jesus was and he had no help from people, you know, he knew this is the only chance, uh, you know, to receive back his sight. What did he do? He didn't stay quiet. He didn't accept the fact that nobody's there to help him, that he has to live the rest of his life being blind. But he does something about it. He screams. He said, uh, Jesus, son of David, or Jesus, son of the most high God, have mercy on me. And God, in uh, Jesus, in that crowd, heard him, you know, and had uh, Bartimaeus brought to him. And Bartimaeus was healed. Jesus said, your faith has healed you and Bartimaeus was able to see. So God in his mercy, you know, uh, gives us his grace. God in his mercy has extended salvation to us. God in his mercy also extends healing. Uh, we see in uh, Titus chapter 2 verse 11 that God in his mercy brings us salvation. Can somebody read that please? Titus chapter 2 verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. Yes, th thank you. So his mercy brings us salvation. Uh, all things that we receive from God, every blessing, even the very breath of life, even the very fact that we are here today and attending class uh, is just an expression of the mercy of God. And God gives us, uh, he extends everything to us, not because we deserve it, uh, even salvation, his love, it says, you know, he demonstrated his love for us while we were yet sinners. You know, Christ Jesus died for us. So we don't deserve his mercy. We don't deserve his goodness, his healing, his blessing. But it's out of his mercy and his uh, grace. Okay. And we, we know that God's mercy is not something that is temporary. Uh, it does not go according to his mood uh, because he's not a moody God. He does not have mood swings, uh, but it's just an attribute of God. That is who he is. Uh, it's the very being of God. And God is always gracious and always uh, merciful. And God in his grace, in his mercy, does not deal with us on the basis of our sins. Uh, he does not even uh, reward us on the basis of what uh, we have achieved or accomplished. He does not even love us on the basis of what we do for him or we don't do, but he just extends his mercy and grace irrespective of our shortcomings, our sinfulness, our waywardness, uh, and us going away from him from time to time. Okay. Uh, the other thing that we need to uh, understand is about God's mercy and God's truth. Okay, God is merciful, he's gracious, but also we know that God is truth and in his truth, he brings about his justice, which means he is a just God. So he punishes sin, he pronounces uh, the judgment because he is just, but his mercy always triumphs over judgment. Okay, yes, God passes a judgment because he's a just God, he has to punish sin. But when we repent, when we ask him for forgiveness, you know, his mercy uh, extends or his mercy triumphs over uh, justice uh, and judgment. Okay, so he carries out what he does with uh, justice, but his mercy triumphs over uh, judgment, which means that, 
you know, it's true what the Bible says in Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 and 8, that we um, uh, reap what we sow. Uh, but God, in his mercy, you know, writes off or cancels off us reaping uh, the evil that, uh, the full evil that we have done or we have sown. Uh, it's because of his mercy that we are not consumed, as it, meant, it says in uh, Lamentations chapter 3, verse uh, 22. And hence we see that God does not deal with us according to our sins, but he extends his uh, mercy okay and the cross is the greatest expression of the grace and the mercy of god so uh, uh, mercy and grace does not come automatically because he's a just god he pronounces a judgment but his mercy and his grace or his mercy triumphs over his judgment and we receive the grace we receive the forgiveness only when we repent and when we ask forgiveness for our sins. So when we repent, or uh, we position ourselves to receive the mercy of God. Okay, so that is about uh, uh, his being merciful and gracious. And then the last one is that he is an unchanging uh, God. Uh, Malachi chapter 3 verse 6 and Hebrews chapter 13 verse 8. Well, this is the last one. Sorry, the previous one was not the last one. Uh, the last one we'll be looking at, he is unchanging. So can somebody read Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, and somebody else can read Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. For I am the Lord, I do not change. Therefore you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. Thank you. Uh, I am the God and I don't change. Okay, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. Can somebody read that, please? Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Thank you. Uh, he's the same. He's the unchanging God. Uh, his nature does not change who he is in the, the Old Testament. He's the same God also of the New Testament. He's the same God that we see throughout uh, uh, history uh, throughout time we will see the same God going forward uh, but what changes is his uh, covenants uh, we see the old covenant in the Old Testament and the new covenant in the uh, New Testament and uh, the covenant uh, that God makes with us are the basis on which uh, you know mankind relates to God. Okay. So in the Old Testament, it reveals that uh, man could experience, um, uh, you know, uh, his relationship with God when he attempts to uh, relate to God on the basis of what he's able to offer God. Okay. So keeping the law very strictly, following the laws, the commandments. And uh, when uh, they uh, sin or uh, when there is sin in the community or a person sins, they have to uh, make the sacrifice, the specific sacrifices explained by God or given by um, God. But in the New Testament, uh, you know, the new covenant reveals how man could relate uh, to God on the basis of grace that is uh, freely given uh, to us that God extends himself to uh, us. Okay, so in the Old Testament, uh, man relates to God on the basis of law, works, and the offerings that he makes. But in the New Testament um, and the new covenant that we are all part of, you know, we relate to God on the basis of grace that he has freely given to us um, uh, because of the sacrifice of Jesus uh, and what God extends to man. So these are the attributes of God that we saw in his nature. There are 14 um attributes of God that we saw. Do you have any comments, any questions? Anything? No questions? Okay. Uh, then we look at... Um, uh, you know, God's nature is not only revealed in his attributes or we we can know the nature of God not only through his attributes, but also through his names that he has revealed uh, to us at different points in history to different people. OK, so we will look at the, the names of God that reveal uh, his nature. 
Okay, so we look at uh, the first common or very general uh, names, and then we'll go on to the specific uh, covenant names of God that reveal His uh, nature. Uh, so Adonai uh, is, which means Lord or Sovereign. Um, it's mentioned for us in Genesis chapter 19, verse 2, uh, where the, you know Lot uh, was sitting at the gate of um, uh, the city, and he sees two men. He does not know that they are angels, and he knows that they are visitors. So he tells them, uh, you know, uh, here now, my lords, please turn into your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you may rise early and go on your way. And they said, no. Uh, we will spend, but we will spend the night in the open square. So he, the word Lord here is Adonai, okay, uh, which is uh, a word that is used to not only specifically for God, but it's also used for anyone who is like a master or owner, somebody who is in an authoritative position, somebody who is a supreme authority. Uh, so this word is a very general term that is used uh, Adonai. The Greek word for Adonai is kurios. Uh, so we see that in the New Testament when we see uh, uh, the New Testament is written in Greek. So we, uh, wherever the word Lord is mentioned, the word kurios is mentioned in the Old Testament. It's Adonai. It basically means Lord or sovereign, and it's a very general term that is used for anyone. Uh, you know, it's used for God and for uh, human beings, just uh, referring to people who are masters, owners, those who are in an authoritative position or in uh, a supreme, okay, in a supreme position. The next uh, uh, name is Elohim. Okay, we read about this in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Uh, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Okay, uh, the word God here is seen as uh, singular, but uh, it's the plural form. Uh, it's talking about the majesty. Okay, the word majesty there. So we see Elohim, the meaning of Elohim is the source of all creation. Okay, God is the source of creation. Uh, we learned about that. He is not only the source of creation, but he also sustains creation. We learned that uh, when we studied uh, uh, systematic theology in our last class. The other uh, name of God uh, that is used is Theos. Okay, uh, it's the equivalent of Elohim. Uh, it's not used for anyone else, but for God, specifically for God himself. Okay, uh, and it's mentioned in John chapter 1, verse 1. Uh, we've read that a couple of times in the, in the past weeks. Uh, in the beginning uh, was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So if you read it uh, in the Greek, in the beginning was the Logos, and the Logos was Theos, uh, and the Word was with God, okay? And the Theos was Logos. So uh, Theos is basically talking about, um, the, is, the, is the term used for God. It's the Greek equivalent for Elohim, just like Kurios is the equivalent for Adonai. Uh, Elohim is the Old Testament uh, name for God, who is the source of all creation. And uh, Theos uh, is the equivalent of Elohim that's in the Greek. That's why we see when John is introducing the Logos as uh, God, the Logos who was there at creation, the Logos who created everything, he's using this word Theos, which is the equivalent for uh, Elohim, which is the source, who is the source of all uh, creation. Okay, And so this word Theos is used uh, not for any other being except for God Him. Self, And then we have the L names of God, L, okay? We have uh, different L names of God, El Shaddai, El Elyon, El Olam. Um, uh, and we will look at what each one means. So L means uh, God. Uh, there are a lot of L names of God, but we'll just be looking at three of them. Uh, El Shaddai, does anyone know what's the meaning of El Shaddai? The one who is more than enough and who is all-sufficient. 
Yes, uh, one who is, thank you, John, one who is all sufficient, uh, who is more than uh, enough. Uh, El Shaddai is the almighty one, the bountiful one, the all sufficient one. And um, this name uh, was revealed to uh, Abraham in Genesis chapter 17, verse 1. Now, Abraham is 99 years old. Um, and he's not yet seen uh, the promised son that uh, God said he would have. Now, when uh, what age was Abraham when God uh, promised him that he will have a son, that he and Sarai will have a son? Any idea which what age was Abraham? Who well, Abram was what age when God promised him? He was 75 years old. Now it's almost going to be like close to uh, 24 years. And he's not seen the promise uh, fulfilled. But, you know, God appears to Abram and when he was 99 years old, Genesis chapter 17 was one. Uh, and God tells him, I am almighty. I am El Shaddai. Okay, so he's saying that uh, you don't have to be afraid uh, how... You know, this promise is going to come through, how it's going to come through, because I am almighty God. I am the all-sufficient one. I am more than sufficient, and I will do what I have uh, promised you, what I have spoken to you. So God is the almighty one. Uh, he's, there's nothing that he can't do, um, uh, you know, and he is all-sufficient for us. That means he's more than enough for us, okay. The next L name of God is we'll be looking at is El Elyon, uh, Genesis chapter 14, verse 9. And El Elyon means the most high uh, God, okay. And uh, it's mentioned here in Genesis chapter 14, verse 19, when, uh, you know, Lot and uh, all the people of Sodom and Gomorrah were attacked and were taken as prisoners. Uh, and when Abraham hears about it, you know, he takes a few men and he goes and defeats those uh, kings. And when he uh, returns after uh, defeating the kings and uh, bringing, he brings back uh, Lot, you know, Melchizedek, the king of Salem, uh, blessed Abram. And he said uh, in verse 19, uh, uh, blessed be, blessed be Abram of God, most high possessor of heaven and earth. So if you read that in Greek, it will be the God most high will be El Elyon, okay, who is the God most high. The next El name of God is El Olam. He is the everlasting God. We read about this in Genesis chapter 21, verse 33. So can somebody turn quickly to Genesis chapter 21, verse 33, please, and read it out? Genesis chapter 21, verse 33. Genesis chapter 21, verse 23. And Abraham planted a groove in a Bethsaida and called there on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. Okay, thank you. Uh, so here we see that he makes uh, in Bathsheba, uh, Abraham makes a treaty with uh, Abimelech, and um, and then we see that he, uh, you know, planted a, a tamarisk tree, uh, and then he called upon the name of the Lord uh, as El Olam, who is the everlasting. Uh, God. Okay, everlasting God, we already looked at this term. Everlasting God means, uh, we studied about it, that uh, he has no beginning, he has no end. Um, you know, from eternity to eternity, he is God, he existed. Uh, there's never a point when he was not, there will never be a point when he will cease to exist, because he is the everlasting God. Okay, so those are the L names of God, just we saw three of them, El Olam, El Elyon, and El Shaddai. Uh, the other name of God is I am who I am. Uh, we already um, looked at this uh, 
at this name of God a couple of times in our previous classes. And uh, it's revealed to us in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, you know, the burning bush when uh, Moses uh, hears God, God is speaking to Moses and, uh, uh, you know, asking him to go to, uh, to Egypt to deliver his people. And when Moses asked him, you know, what should I tell the elders, the name of the God, uh, the God who sent me, he says, uh, tell them I am. Uh, uh, that I am. Okay, so what does it mean? It means that God is eternal. He is self-sufficient. He is self-existent. Uh, he does not depend on anyone or anything for his uh, existence. Okay, so we had already looked at this uh, at this uh, name of God. I am that I am. The other commonly used name of God is Yahweh. Um, but it's a name that uh, people in the Old Testament never used to utter on their lips, Yahweh. So the, uh, the equivalent names they would use as Jehovah, uh, which they would call out, but they would never utter this name Yahweh in, uh, with fear and because of fear and reverence for who God is. So the equivalent name for Yahweh is uh, Jehovah, and Yahweh means uh, the Lord. Okay, so we look at some names uh with uh, Jehovah. We look at Jehovah Rapha, uh, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Nissi, Jehovah Shalom, Jehovah Sabbath, uh, Jehovah Mikadishim, Jehovah Rohi, Jehovah, Jehovah Siddiku, and Jehovah uh, Shama. Okay, so what is uh, this? The first name, Jehovah Rapha, is uh, uh, something that all of us know. What is the meaning of Jehovah Rapha? The God who heals. Thank you. Uh, the Lord, our healer, the Lord, my healer. And uh, this is uh, uh, given to us or revealed to us in Exodus chapter 15, verse 26, um, where God says, if tells the people that if they heed his uh, voice, do what is right in his sight, keep all his commandments and statutes, and he will not put on them the diseases that he brought upon the Egyptians. And then he says, for I am the Lord who heals. That means he reveals uh, his covenant name of Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals. Jehovah Nissi is uh, the Lord my banner, the Lord my victory. Uh, we read about this in Exodus chapter 17 um, when, uh, you know, uh, 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 the Amalekites, I think, they come to fight against um, uh Amalek, sorry, Amalek comes to fight against the uh, uh, Israelites and uh, Moses uh, sends Joshua and his the soldiers the next morning to fight. And Moses goes on a mountain where he can see the battle, where he can see the whole battle happening. And uh, he stretches out his uh, hand. And as long as he stretches out his hand, uh, you know, the, is, the Israelites are winning the battle. But when he's tired and he puts his hand down, they begin to lose the battle. So... Uh, the two people who are with him, you know, uh, they put a stone where he sits down and both of them lift up uh, Moses' hand. His hand is stretched out throughout the day and uh, the uh, Israelites win the battle. And after they win the battle, you know, God makes a promise to them. And then Moses builds an altar there and he calls on the name of the Lord as Jehovah Nissi, which means the Lord, my, the Lord is my banner or the Lord is my victory. He always always gives me the victory. The next name is Jehovah Jireh, which is a very uh, common name, which we all know the meaning of it. What's the meaning of Jehovah Jireh? The Lord, my provider. Thank you. The Lord, my provider. Uh, and where does this, is this name of God revealed to us? Any idea? Ma'am, when Abraham was going to sacrifice his son Isaac, Thank you. Uh, yes, he's going to sacrifice. Abraham is taking his son, his only son of promise, Isaac, to sacrifice him on the mountain that God showed him. And when he is going to kill his son the, on the altar that he makes, God says, uh, stop, Abraham. Now I know that you love me, that you will not even withheld your only son from me. And then God shows him a ram that's caught up in the in the bushes and he takes that ram and he makes that uh, makes a sacrifice and he calls upon the name as uh, jo uh, the name of God is Jehovah Jireh the Lord will provide okay the next name is Jehovah Shalom uh, Shalom you know what the meaning of Shalom is 
the peace with be you yes jehovah shalom it's a uh, it's a very beautiful uh, covenant name of god it does not just mean shalom does not just mean peace it's a very comprehensive word it's a very full word it means uh, peace it means prosperity uh, well being wholeness it also means preservation from every kind of harm and danger and preservation and protection from evil so it's a very comprehensive full uh, word shalom which not only just means peace but well being wholeness prosperity uh, protection and preservation from evil from every kind of harm and uh, danger and this name was revealed uh, to gideon in judges chapter 6 uh, you know when um, uh, god calls uh, gideon as the judge to uh, you know go and fight against the midianites because the midianites were uh, uh, controlling the israelites they were harassing them they were taking away all of their uh, produces the harvest time and uh, you know they basically um, uh, you know Uh, stripped the Israelites of everything that they had, and the people cried out to God. And God, you know, chose Gideon as the next uh, leader. And Gideon sees himself very small, unfit for the task. And um, uh, you know, but we see that um, uh, you know uh, the angel of the Lord uh, comes, and then he makes a sacrifice. He wants to present something to the angel, and. Uh, he goes and makes bread and brings uh, soup and uh, meat and the angel uh, tells him to keep it on the altar there and the angel just touches it and gets it uh, it all gets consumed by fire and uh, gideon realizes that he's not seen a man but he's seen an angel he's very afraid but uh, the lord tells gideon peace be with you do not fear you shall not die and uh, there gideon builds an altar to the lord and he calls on the name of the lord as jehovah shalom the lord is peace okay we'll end here because uh, our time is already up uh, we'll look at the other five names of god in the next class anyone has any questions any doubts no no okay okay thank you everyone for joining class i'll see you on friday but before you come to class on friday uh, i request all of you to please just go through your notes uh, and come so uh, if you have any questions and uh, you know we can have a meaningful time of uh, discussion as well okay have a good day and uh, god bless all of you and happy republic day it's our republic day for our nation so happy republic day all of you thank you everyone see you all bye Okay. Happy, happy public.